Recording. Let's do it. Welcome to the Coconuts Podcast. Today is February 25, 2022. The Coconuts Podcast is your home for top trending news and pop culture from all across Southeast Asia and Hong Kong. I'm Samantha Beltran. And I'm Andra Nazri. Hi, Andra. Mariga Yankaraman. Is that no. how you say it? <laughs> Actually, Maliga, pretty good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so the song would yeah. actually go Maliga Yang Bati, which is happy greeting. Ah, damn it. I guess Google Ka-Aron. Translate. No, but no, that's actually accurate. Like, uh, if you were to greet me, that's what you would say. But if you were to sing it, because probably Ka'arawan wouldn't fit into the, <laughs> you know, the cadence of, of the of the song. So we changed it ah. to Bati. Well, but yeah, that for... was a really good. <laughs> thank you for <laughs> ruining my song, my happy birthday song to you. Oh! You who just turned 39 um, this week. 40, so actually. happy birthday, Sam. <laughs> you bitch. No, I'm kidding. Aww, thanks. <laughs> How was your birthday? Thanks, Andra. Oh, God. Um, so I didn't really make any plans for, for, for my birthday. Um, you know, it was a typical work day as it was. But then one of my friends decided to surprise me. And this is like par for the course for him, right? Because he's a home cop. So, but of course, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't the type to expect any surprise. So long story short is that he prepared a dessert for me. So he made something like a mango float. I'm not sure if you know what that is, probably. And yeah. this is normally like a super easy dessert to make. But him being the extra person, of course, he had to, you know, you know, like use daqua and and all that and all those fancy gourmet stuff. Uh, but yeah, long story short. And then he was so extra and was so insistent on not ruining the surprise. You know what he did? So he blocked me on Instagram and had to make up some bullshit excuse about how his Instagram was down and everything only to turn up like, you know, oh, hey, surprise, happy birthday. Here's like a, <laughs> here's a dessert I made all afternoon for you. And I had to block you just so you wouldn't, you know, spoil it. I guess that was that. Hey, that really um, made the birthday. For we have sure. something else. We have something else special for you lined up today. Ooh, we do. We do. We do? Um, it's we do. in the form of. Uh, <laughs> no, don't expect like an actual present to come through your door because that would be insane. Uh-huh. Um, no, it's uh, it's our it's our guest today who happens to be your sorority sister. Damn it! No, why? <laughs> no, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you have to reveal like my secret ties and me pulling special strings? But no, yeah. So we do have a special guest coming on today. Uh, yes, yeah, she is my sorority sister, University of the Philippines represent. But yeah, uh, so she is Ash Presto. So she is a Filipino sociologist currently taking up her master's in public policy at NUS, the National University of Singapore, who is amazing, amazing, amazing at commentary. And she is with us. She's coming on today to talk to us about Filipino politics and oh, you know, the upcoming such elections. Such an interesting topic. But before we go into all that, the time calls for Top Stories of the Week. From a man painting artwork with his pee to alien worshippers in Bangkok, Coconuts TV brings you wacky and impactful documentaries from across the region. Don't miss out. Head down to our Coconuts TV YouTube channel to subscribe and enjoy. Beginning with Bangkok. So, Andra, do you by any chance like Korean barbecue? Because here in love. Manila, it's everywhere. You yeah, love it. absolutely love it. I can't, I can't get enough. I Even know, though right? I'm technically, I'm mostly vegetarian. But um, I do allow myself the occasional Korean barbecue and just pig out. And on yeah, meat. exactly. And I mean, uh, what I like about it is that, you know, you do have varieties of meat. So I guess like with the Korean version, you know, you have pork belly and then now there's beef and then you could do it with chicken as well. So apparently, so it's, yeah, it's, it's crazy um, around the region and, you know, Thailand is no exception to it. But this particular um, BBQ joint in Bangkok has won internet hearts because the owner just, uh, wait for it, grilled meat for a blind couple oh isn't that the cutest thing you've ever heard yeah yeah so i know and i mean you know this should be i mean it is adorable i guess like now now that i've had a chance to sort of go through my (laughs) to go through the chatter but yeah 
it should be sort of the norm, no? But yeah, basically mm. in Bangkok, what happened is that, you know, two blind patrons who are, of course, unable to grill their own meals like in on, like on the table, when they contacted this Korean barbecue um, joint, um, the owner did more than just welcome them. So uh, it's a it's a joint called Ni Sol and it's located in Soy Sukumvit 70. And what the owner did was that she had personally prepared their food and grilled the barbecue for them so that they could have a good meal. Yeah, so she wrote on on social media, uh, Tonight my heart is full. I'm very happy. We are all friends, brothers and sisters. Uh, If you can read this on your iPhone, I would like to say thank you very much. If there's another opportunity, allow me to help you grill, peel shrimp and shellfish again. So what happened was that, so the couple had actually um, contacted the restaurant asking if they could be accommodated because they have not been allowed to dine in at similar Korean barbecue restaurants in Bangkok because of the fact that they're, yeah, because of the fact that they're, that they're blind. That's pretty fucked up. I know. And I guess, you know, I, I want to understand that, you know, that they probably didn't want to outright discriminate them maybe it was like a matter of staffing issue like oh mm-hmm. do we have enough staff to to accommodate them but you know this should be something that this should be food for thought for a lot of food um establishment owners really like are we being inclusive enough to all yeah. kinds of diners who would walk through our doors right so yeah so definitely the owner you know they yeah, again, she did more than just welcome them, but actually sat down with them for hours, for like two hours and, you know, talked to them and prepared their their food. Yeah. So it had about 2,000 comments. Uh, obviously, it blew up on, on social media. And, you know, a lot of the, the readers thanked the owner for being so kind and considerate for, you know, consider it to to her customers. And it was, you know, the owner said that it was a learning experience for um, yeah, and if you look at the photos in that Facebook post, um, aside from like the one um, group shot, group photo of them together, like when she was actually grilling the meat for them, when the owner was grilling the meat for them, she actually had the courtesy to put on her mask as well, which was, oh. like, it just it just kind of shows you what kind of, you know, like courteous person she is. And yeah, that is, that's my interesting heart is that you pick that up. I know, that's interesting that you picked that up. Like, I actually didn't notice that. Like, you have such a keen eye. That's awesome. Aww, yeah, but you're you. right. Yeah. No, yeah, but that's 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 awesome. Yeah, like, now that you mention it, like, imagine. Like, these people wouldn't have known, right, <laughs> that she no. was wearing a mask. But because, you know, she's so she's in close proximity to them. And yeah, you know that exactly. she just really wanted to help out. That's such a feel-good story. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, and th- things are about to get... Uh... We're gonna go on a dark turn. Uh-huh. Okay, let me preface this coconut shikarta story by saying that, you know, I, I believe all breasts uh, are beautiful, whatever size and shape they come they come in. But okay. obviously, obviously, there is a market for breast fillers. Is that, that's a thing, right? Breast fillers are like breast enhancement yeah. surgery. Okay. Mm-hmm. Sure, yeah, like, for sure. You, know, you can you can get them in Jakarta legally, and and I, I believe in Philippines as well, right? Sure. But you know, like the the premium stuff, like the actual authentic stuff, or like, well, <laughs> when I say authentic, I mean you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean this the safe stuff, you know, they're they're pretty okay, they, they they're pretty steep, right? Sure, sure, they are, yeah. Yeah, so what happened tragically in Jakarta recently, um, this woman was found dead at a hotel in West Jakarta. And police said she under recently underwent uh, breast filling procedure. So the victim is, uh, was uh, identified as a 34-year-old by the initials okay. RCD. And police investigation into her death found that she may have died from complications resulting from a botched breast filler procedure carried out by an unlicensed practitioner. And um, unfortunately, in this story, there's an element of uh, transphobia as well because uh, in the part of the police, because they were saying that um, they really hammered in the fact that this person who carried out the procedure was not a doctor, was not a licensed medical professional. No, she was just the trans woman. Yeah. Yeah. We don't know yet, as of this recording time, if the practitioner has been caught. But other details that have emerged from this is that the victim only paid 3.5 million rupiah for the procedure. And that's $240 US, which would you say, yeah, I'd say is, is pretty cheap 
like dangerously cheap, right? Wow. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, if you put it in US dollars, but I was about to ask, like, would you know the going rate or like maybe like a, a rough rate of how much legal procedures would, would yeah, would, would fetch in Jakarta? Yeah, I looked it up. Not that I've had okay. it. I've looked it. I looked it up for this story. Um, okay, we're talking like upwards of ten million, ten to twenty. Wow. Yeah, that is. Yeah, I mean, like three point five million rupiah. That really sounds too good to be true. But yeah, mm-hmm. that, that is interesting that you mentioned that the police had to identify the, the perpetrator as a trans woman because it's really not relevant. It's not. To, I think I think they're the just trying to get brownie points from like the trans bashing conservatives who are probably yeah. saying like, oh, of course she went to a trans woman because tra- the trans woman probably had it done herself, you know? Damn. And I mean, to be fair, um, cosmetic surgery, it can be, you know, a contentious topic. Like I know myself, like if I bring this up to a group of friends, we would be divided on the issue. But I personally, I I support cosmetic surgery. I believe that, you know, women have, and I mean, everybody for that matter, they do have a right to choose whatever they want to do with their with their bodies. And it's kind of sad that, you know, this woman would be, would feel forced to undergo, you know, a dangerous um, procedure just because you know the the prices for a legal procedure would otherwise be you know out of reach so yeah yeah. so on to more depressing stories so in hong kong they just had their youngest fatality uh you know an an 11 month old girl who was infected with covid passed away and the thing is they never fully knew or they never fully confirmed the cause of death for the for the baby but um the 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 infant was test like the infant tested positive for COVID nineteen and was intubated and placed at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital's pediatric intensive care unit. So yeah, so in in a press briefing, the hospital authority's chief manager Lao Kahin said that you know the the infant was sent to the emergency department as she developed convulsions and had been in good health before that until you know un- yeah until until 4 a.m when she did develop a fever and convulsions so yeah so unfortunately her condition deteriorated rapidly and she had a she suffered a cardiac arrest on saturday and unfortunately passed away on sunday yeah so authorities said that they couldn't identify the cause of death at the moment and you know they uh, the because the patient was just admitted for one to two days and some of the family members uh, also did the rapid antigen test at home and got the positive result. So, mm. yeah, so not directly confirmed that the, the infant died of COVID, but definitely linked, like there's a strong link to the whole COVID surge in, in Hong Kong. Which is really sad because I, I think that was uh, last week when we were talking about um, their youngest death at the time, which was a three-year-old girl, and it just seems like, the patients yeah. are just getting younger and younger. You know, well, hopefully, hearts. hopefully Hong Kong just gets out of this sooner rather than later. Exactly, and you know, hope that and children the world, and of, of for that matter. You of know? course, exactly. So sick exactly. of it. Exactly. Fucking COVID. I know. Uh, oh my god. We'll have we'll have we'll have, new, we'll have new things to worry about soon. <laughs> that sounds like a weirdly good thing. <laughs> weirdly <laughs> optimistic. Cynical but optimistic. Yeah, mm, that's me. That is you on brand. I guess for um, s- some optimism, we go to Bali, where you know this time we're not going to talk about terrorism because I think we've okay. exhausted that topic. Um, yeah, tourists are coming back, blah blah blah. Uh, but you may know that in Indonesia we have some really weird um, IT laws and pornography laws, wherein people who you know, records, you know, sexual stuff like sex tapes uh, for private private use. Like they can be tried and sentenced if through, not through their doing, if the content, you know, leaks online, right? If somebody else yeah. leaks it, you can still sure. get jailed for it, right? So what happened in Bali recently was the kind of the opposite of that, um, thankfully. <laughs> So what? Um, so there was this young couple who were kind of like getting down to business at a local public park. Okay. And then, so while they were doing it, um, 
CCTV cameras caught them in the act. Um, somehow that footage leaked online. So the police were initially going after the couple. Uh, it was pretty. It was pretty hard to make out who they were, but apparently they've identified the woman. But I, no arrests have been made yet, except for like, how do you think the CCTV would get out in the first place? Exactly, because somebody else would have leaked it. Yeah, and it turns out that the leakers are two officers from the Bali police. So God. they were. They were supervising the CCTV network when the couple were getting down to it, and then they decided to, you know, save the video and share it with um, their colleagues. And um, long story short, that spread everywhere, and now the two were they, they've been arrested. Um, I guess internally because they don't really make a big show out of arresting police officers, and they're being questioned by internal affairs and may face um, serious sanctions, which have not yet been disclosed or revealed. But yeah, this okay, is so- like a, a tables have turned uh, kind of moment uh, in terms of the IT and pornography law in Indonesia. Which for is, one. I guess, sort of a good thing because they were going after the people who were actually responsible for leaking the the video for for once yeah for once and they happen to be police officers which is you know uh, they they like they probably a lot of us probably thought that if they were police officers then they probably would have been immune from you know criminal charges but apparently not in this case yeah good on Bali then for you know keeping their officers in in line somehow i am curious though Because we do talk about the pornography laws in in Indonesia, but is there any sort of is there any law that prohibits like public acts of I don't know like like public sex acts or public acts of indecency yeah. and yeah like would 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 the couple be be liable for that are they held liable? Um, personally, I, I like like what they did was obviously wrong in the context of Indonesian law, but personally, sure. I hope that that they don't find them. Uh, authorities don't find them because you know sex is sex it's normal it's natural whatever exactly. just they were doing it in like some secluded corner nobody saw um but uh if we're talking if, like based on previous cases um yeah public indecency is a pretty serious crime okay and it's one that's punishable by like up to two years and eight months in prison wow all for just getting busy and bumping their crotches <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean, I share that sentiment. You know, I hope they don't get caught. <laughs> yeah, like next time, just get a room, though, kids. I know, or safety. like exactly, exactly. I mean, I was gonna ask how much the going rates in the motels are, but I feel like that's going to prolong the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's cheap. Just just it's really cheap. Okay, so so there, so there you have it. You know, get a room, as they say. So yeah, on to my home turf here in Manila. So this uh, this singer named Jake Cyrus. So he posted a topless photo. So Jake Cyrus is a transgender man, and of course he had gotten mixed reactions to his social media post. Uh, it proves that you know basically the Philippines, no matter how tolerant they say, relatively tolerant they say that the country is when it comes to the LGBTQ community, like just basically proves that we suck still at genuine LGBTQ acceptance. So yeah, so Jake Cyrus, he's a he's an internationally known singer actually. Mm. Um, and he had gotten, you know, he 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 came out earlier in the 2010s as, you know, as a transgender man and yeah, he released a topless photo of himself 5 years after he had gone through top surgery, which is also known as a chest reconstruction surgery, where you know he has his breasts mm. removed for a more masculine appearance. So his post read, "I thought long and hard whether I should post this, as I've, I always think about what other people say. And throughout the years that I've transitioned, I have been happy with the course of my life, but I've always felt insecure about my body, perhaps also because of most people's standards. And you know, of course, despite mustering the courage, because that is pretty hard, you know, five years, and then you've only found the courage to to post about it now. And yeah. you know, it's definitely a photo that speaks to his progress. Uh, of course, 
Philippines being the Philippines, the singer's post has earned mixed reactions from people. Of course, there were those that supported him. But of course, there were a lot of those that ridiculed the singer. And there were those that outright condemned Cyrus. So yeah, so these posts have even gone so far as to dead naming the singer or, you know, referring to his birth name before he transitioned. And, you know, a lot of them, of course, invoked religion as, you know, the Philippines is still a predominantly Christian or Catholic country. Mm. So some of the, yeah, some of the posts read, um, they even said like, oh, I don't agree with what you did. It would have been fine if you didn't want to act feminine, but I hope you just stayed content with whatever God has given you. And sometimes people have insecurities because they don't know how to love and accept what God has given them. Do you think what you did was amusing? It's not nice, especially for your family who loves you, and especially in the eyes of who created and gave your boobs that you have taken away. And yeah, and then some of them even went so far as to say, you still get your period. You're still a woman, even if the world turns upside down. So it really that's nasty stuff i know it's really nasty and it really shows that you know the lived experiences of queer folk in the philippines they really tend to be harsher than what you know media likes to present that we are you know i i think that there was a a a survey at one point that said that the philippines was one of if not the most tolerant uh, i guess it's just one of the most because because you know you have Mm. taiwan who has now accepted you know same-sex marriage but yeah the philippines has said that it's one of the most tolerant countries when it comes to lgbtq communities but of course you have um you know administration like the duterte administration where the soji equality bill and i think i've we've, we've talked about this before but it's basically a bill that has languished for years in congress since he became president and you know of course you have Manny Pacquiao who everybody knows Mm. is a boxing legend and a presidential candidate and we'll get into that later he had a statement where he compared gay people to you know to to animals but you know what's what's nice about yeah Jake Cyrus is that you know he basically just accepted that this was going to come you know like of course he's not going to get the outright acceptance from everybody but said that you know he's no longer asking for anybody's opinion and him posting the photo was for other transgender people to see and, you know, sort of gain, you know, strength and courage to really, you know, live their truth. So, yeah, good on Jake. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's saying all that um, really courageous stuff. But um, <clears throat> obviously, like, I can't even imagine how hard this must be for him, regardless of the courage he's showing, you know. And I hope he continues to have that strength um, going exactly. forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, respect. All right. Speaking of um, respect, Sam, imagine you were driving Ew. down the highway um, and oh, you okay. see a wild boar right in, the, okay. in front of you in the middle of the road. What do you do? Um, I stop and I let the wild boar, you know, quietly pass the road and hope that the boar doesn't turn into roadkill by some other vehicle. <laughs> Well, you're not as heroic as the Singaporean man who did who, huh. who's a, who did a little bit extra than that. Um, okay. By the way, you should never stop in the middle of the highway, Sam. That's dangerous. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot uh, for the road traffic <laughs> reminder. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm assuming. I hope I'm assuming this guy, this masked Singaporean hero. I'm assuming he um, pulled his car over to the side and got out. Hopefully he didn't stop his car in the middle of the road. I, it doesn't really say. But um, anyway, he got out of his car and he swooped in to save the wild boar who was just kind of like sitting there while all these cars drive by. What? Okay. That is um, interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally, like, I wouldn't dare come near it because wild boars are pretty fucking insane. Not to mention, like, the diseases they might carry. I don't know. Sure. That's valid. Um, but yeah, this guy is getting, like, being cheered on as a hero. And just, like, to, to quote some um, comments people have been saying on the social media post that's gone viral. One said, respect law, brother. Not all will risk their life to save an, an animal, especially on the expressway. The good will come back to you. Um, someone said, maybe the good will come back and like bark crackling. <laughs> right. That is so sick. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Um, yeah. We need, okay. um, 
just to give a little bit of a context, you know, Singapore has seen, seen a rise of wild boars roaming its streets lately. And, you know, as cute as they may look, they're still wild and can be aggressive when disturbed. And, uh, and people do uh, tend to walk away from encounters uh, with the wild boar. Yeah, those things are fucking tough. Like, I wouldn't come near it at all. And this guy I, like, I know how he just confidently exactly just confidently picked it up like it was a little puppy like oh hey i'm just casually putting this adorable gentle harmless you know puppy on the side of the road and yeah good on him that he didn't get you know bitten or or whatever good on you la good on you bro on over to yangon so a battered myanmar model recounts her harrowing abduction from her home in yangon so what happened was this model and actress from Myanmar was released from detention a day after she was abducted at gunpoint from her home in Yangon by security forces both in and out of uniform. So this model and actress, whose name is Tin Tin, thanked those who expressed concern for her safety after she was handcuffed and arrested by about 50 troops and paramilitaries in the Tamwa wow. township of Yangon. I know, like a single woman. By 50 troops. I know. And then she... yeah. So, so what so, did you so do? She, so what happened was um, the men showed up at her door. And, you know, you have to understand, like, this woman, she's an actress and a model. But as of late, like, she's known to be, like, an outspoken critic of the of the junta in mm. Myanmar. They they showed up at her at her door at, uh, at 11 p.m. And said that they were going to check her overnight guest list. So apparently, that's a thing now in in Myanmar, where um, you have to submit a, a list of of yeah of everybody staying at your house overnight uh, each night, I suppose. So I guess that was so they they went to her under the guise of you know checking out the overnight guest list. Yeah. So what happened was uh, she said that she was apprehended and interrogated as well about her past protest activities and was also insulted by the authorities who showed up at her doorstep and she refused to answer their questions. So, and she did live stream the, abdu the abduction as it happened. And yeah, she did um, enter some sort of like, um, like a conversation, like a negotiation with these authorities who demanded that she unlock her front door so that they can get her guest list. And then after she relents and opens the door, a masked man in a plaid shirt and flip-flops with a rifle slung over his shoulder approaches her and grabs her phone and then struggles for a bit before the live stream ends. So that's really disturbing. Well, yeah. So, yeah. But at least... Um, yeah she's she's released she's safe now hopefully right exactly exactly and you know the military hasn't said anything so they haven't published any information about detaining her and you know the video has since been removed so we don't really know completely know the full story of why she was abducted and the circumstances that led to it apart from what was shown in the live stream video but again you know uh I, at least she's home in one piece and yeah our hearts really go out to these people who are unfortunately being persecuted by by forces just because of you know dissenting opinions yeah so as promised earlier i am really excited to nerd out and talk politics specifically filipino politics with you me sam too, me too, me and too. our guest today ash presto Today, we are having a very special guest on the podcast. So, Andra, you know how we've been covering a lot of Filipino politics in the past weeks because we're leading up to the elections. Yep, you know, fascinating stuff. Bong, bong, bing, bong, binge. Yeah, okay. So, rather than listen to my half-baked commentary on the Coconuts website, today we have somebody who probably knows a little bit or, you know, a lot more of this than I do. We have a special guest with us today. She is Ash Presto. She is, uh, her Twitter handle is at Socialoija on Twitter. That's S-O-S-Y-O-L-O-H-I-J-A for anybody interested in following her. And, you know, she's actually earned like quite a bit of a following based on her, you know, on her insights. And she's currently a sociologist studying public policy at the National University of Singapore. Hello, Ash. 
Hello. So, welcome to, be to the podcast. Thank you for inviting me. No, Ash, thank you so uh, much for freeing up your time. Yeah, thank yeah, you for coming you on. I just want to say, though, like a sociologist studying public policy, I don't think there's like a more apt person to talk about um, Filipino politics because above like every other country, the way that your politics unfolds has like way larger sociopol- sociopolitical ramifications than a lo- uh, like many other countries, in my opinion. Yes, and you know, sociologists are actually very active in political life, at least in the Philippines. So yes, happy to be here. Yeah, we're really, really excited. Um, you know, we we've been I, well. I have personally, you know, since I'm from the Manila website, I've been riling Andra up. I think <laughs> based on the recent events, but it's really nice to finally get your insight on why you know the elections, particularly in the Philippines, are very important. The upcoming May elections are significant, and of course, because it is kind of like a, a turning point. Uh, I don't know if you would agree with me, Ash, considering you know how we've been under you know the past six years, and of course, we have a an interesting contender. We have a, a bunch of interesting contenders coming up, actually. So yeah, did you want to kick us off, Andra? Sure. Yeah, you were saying six six years under Duterte. So how does it right. how does the ter- uh, presidential term system work in the Philippines? Is it like one term of six or two terms of six? It's one term of six years, and the election is not possible. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty. That's pretty. Um, I guess that has it both its uh, pros and cons, right? But yeah, of course. Do you think Do you think Filipinos like in general are satisfied with what Duterte has achieved over the past six years? That's a tricky question, actually. If you look at all of the surveys, um, the satisfaction of Duterte is actually at an all-time high. So he has maintained a high satisfaction rating throughout the six years of his term, which no other president have done in the past, not even his predecessor, Benigno Noynoy Aquino, who is deemed to be you know, very efficient in riling up the, social, the, the economic conditions of the country. So if you look at the surveys, yes. If you look at... Um, the people who have suffered under the pandemic. And if you look at activists, student groups, um, etc., who are critical of the administration and how different pub- policies of the Duterte administration have been run, for example, the war on drugs, and they would say that they are very unsatisfied. So what do these numbers mean, actually? If you look at the satisfaction rating, that's very high, but also we have a lot of contentions on the ground. And it just means that the Philippines is actually a very a country with an active civil society, but also mm. with a working, with a working on paper, on a very basic uh, ethos, a working democracy. Because so far, Duterte has been there, has been elected through an election, has been maintaining a high population, a high rating, as per, you know, surveys of the population. It's just that he has very contentious policies. Um, war on drugs, the Bill Bill campaign, which are not, all encompassingly good for the population. If you look at the middle class, they have been relatively safe so far. Um, if you look at the people who are really in the fringes of, of uh, the population, then you can see that they have been the recipients of all of the negative consequences of, of policies. And there have been a lot of groups sem- sympathetic to people in the margins receiving the negative end of the policies. So the answer is, you know, it's complicated. <laughs> But mm. yeah, but if you read me to summarize in just one one sentence, um, here it is. So the policies of the tech are very contentious. Um, people who have who, who are sympathetic of those receiving the negative consequences of policies are of course very unsatisfied. But the population who are relatively okay with the administration are very satisfied, and it shows in the remaining high ratings of the president up until his sixth term in office. Would you be able to say who the people, um, like what groups are satisfied? Hmm, that's very difficult because the the surveys actually just only divide, categorize based on social economic status. Mm. But you know the discontent of the Duterte administration is not only coming from you know those from the lower social economic status, but also coming from those in the middle and those from the top. From the top specifically because the, the Duterte administration has also targeted different kinds of elites, especially elite families who are associated with the previous administration. And the Duterte, the Duterte administration has also 
doubled down on the media, uh, mm. which is yeah, which a lot of middle class people you know read and rely on for for their news. So in terms of you know the kinds of groups, values, and you know cultural democratic ethos that differ that make those people disagreeing with Duterte different. The surveys don't really capture that. Right. The surveys only divide between socioeconomic status. So I'm going to answer based on you know, what I see, based on my conjecture. Um, and it will be very hard to substantiate using data, but using you know numbers, because we don't mm. really gather all of those information. But usually, the people who are very unsatisfied are the families of the victims of the drug war of the Duterte administration, and also the families of uh, people who are affected by the closing of ABS-CBN. We have 11,000 workers there, and 11,000, if those are all breadwinners, then we have you know 11,000 families who are finding it hard to find livelihood, especially in a time of pandemic. And of course, uh, medical professionals, because the Duterte administration has been such a lackluster in terms of their pandemic response. Um, um, yeah, so, uh, sorry, yeah. go ahead. Yes, yeah, sure. Yes, Sam. Um. No, I was just going to um, add context that um, ABS-CBN, for our listeners, it well, prior to its closure, um, because uh, the, the renewal wasn't picked up by the House of Representatives, they actually blocked it. Um, it was the biggest broadcaster in the country. Therefore, uh, when it closed, it cost uh, the the livelihood of over eleven thousand employees, and of course, you know, it uh, the families of those employees affected. Just to sort of you know provide that certain magnitude of why it was very you know it it was a significant event. Sorry, yeah, I just want to say, like at the same time, um, I remember you writing a story a couple of weeks ago, Sam, about how one Big Brother host, like a celebrity, oh, uh, yeah. ended up representing <laughs> um, yeah, Tony Gonzaga. Yeah, ended up re- representing what I would say is like uh, the continuation of the Duterte administration, which goes right, to show right. that the elites are in bed with Duterte's Yes, plan. but there's actually, you know, more context and more complications to that. First of all, the 11,000 workers come from various parts of the Philippines. So even in, you know, geographically remote areas, the ABS-CBN has some presence there. So because of the Philippines, we all know, is very vulnerable to climate shock. So we're, we are the fourth most vulnerable country in the world um, when it comes to the negative impacts of climate change. The ABS-CBN broadcasting company has been there to provide the news and information for people in geographically isolated areas. So now, since you have now closed down, the the company people who are you know by the sea very vulnerable to, to the, the incoming typhoon they don't have any information now mm. when they don't get their news from um, nowadays so the broad i don't know if this is part of the podcast anymore but i think it's very important to mention that the frequency of the abs cbn channel was gifted i would say it was gifted to apollo kiboloy who has a standing warrant who has a standing case in the united states for sexual harassment and and um child trafficking the oh, wow. privacy has been gifted to him and now the news channel the new news channel using the previously abs cbn frequency is now like a propaganda machine skewing this information oh. about not only the Duterte, but also Bongbong Marco. So, and it goes way back because the ABS-CBN has also been the first media to be, has also been among the first media to be targeted by the father, Ferdinand Marcos Sr., when he declared martial law. Because the law says the elite family who basically own and control ABS-CBN are very much close with the Aquinos. Yes. So yes. Those oh, yeah, so if, yeah, the more uh, you I dig, think, Andra, hey, exactly, the like it's, it's, like, I think I, I talked about this in an email with Ash, like, before she came on, right? I was like, there is so much ground to cover that, like, you know, like, more than what we can actually cover in a single podcast. But, yeah, like, once you just start scratching the surface, there's so much to to unpack and uncover. And, yeah, so we actually wrote a story about that on Coconuts Manila about um, why the ABS-CBN um, issue in particular is fraught with a lot of historical um yeah it's 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 fraught with a lot of historical context because it isn't the first time that they were targeted like ash mentioned um they were first um forced 
uh, closure by the Marcos regime, like during like when when martial law was 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 declared, um, the assets were of course um, seized and they were off air for for quite some time. So. Yeah, lots of stuff to uncover. And, you know, we're really excited to, you know, pick pick more of, you know, Ash's insights on the rest. So, Ash, um, in light of the coming elections, the presidential elections, which is this May, could we do a rundown of who the candidates are? Probably the major candidates who could possibly replace Duterte once the elections, you know, roll around? Uh, sure. So I will mention six um, candidates. So, of course, you have Bongbong Marcos, the son of the late dictator Ferdinand Marcos and the namesake of the late dictator Ferdinand Marcos. He has been topping the survey so far with 60% um, coming into the campaign wow. season. And it is the highest um, that we have seen so far in the mm. democratic history of the Philippines. And you also have the far second um, coming at 20%. We have Lenny Robredo. Lenny Robredo is the current vice president and has been associated as an opposition for the whole entirety of the Duterte administration. And she has been very much targeted also, not only by Duterte, but also by Bongbong Marcos, who, by the way, w- lost by a very marginal um, number in 2016. So for the longest time, he has been, you know, count contesting the, the win of Vice President, calling Vice President Lenny Robredo a cheater, etc. And you also have a very famous boxer. His name is, of course, Manny Pacquiao. He's very famous, especially in Southeast Asia. <laughs> so he is also you running know who he is, right, Andra? President. Yeah, yes, sure, Pacquiao. of course. <laughs> <laughs> I always get asked, like, Ash, why is Manny Pacquiao running for president? What happened to your country? He was, well, he was a huge hero of mine until some of his views just you know, came out of his mouth. Came to light. Exactly. Yeah. I know. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Ash. Sorry. Right? Please, please do go on. I mean, just a side note. Yeah. So a lot of people, especially here, uh, are asking me like, oh, Ash, why is Panama here running? That's crazy. But I will say we also have action stars who are not college graduates winning the presidency like Arab Estrada. So no, that's really, that's really not crazy at all. This isn't the first time. Exactly. It's not the first time this is happening, people. We have had legitimate celebrities, you know, very Sylvester Stallone. Like imagine a Filipino Sylvester Stallone actually <clears throat> sitting as president. No, that, that is how crazy and how much of a of, of a of a circus you know Philippine politics is. Mm. So yeah, Manny Pacquiao not completely Manny out of the Pacquiao. question. Yeah. Later on, I, I later on we'll talk about that. The what you mentioned a while ago some the turning point in Philippine democracy. Okay, so just to continue, you have Bambu Marcos and Robredo, Manny Pacquiao, you also have Ping Lacson. Ping Lacson is this policeman who has branded himself to be clean, who has branded himself to be this leader has a political will to clean the whole corrupt Philippine National Police. Because if you're here from the Philippines and you see the Philippine National Police, the first thing you you, you think about is the word patola, which means like lackluster, very incompetent police, but also corrupt. So Ping National has been the Philippine National Chief and he has made some progress, although a little bit in cleaning the Philippine National Police, but a little bit of progress is already a big progress given how corrupt the institution is. He is a veteran senator, also running for president. You have the fifth one, Isko Moreno. Isko Moreno is an actor who is currently the mayor of Manila City. Uh, there's really not much to say about Isko except that he plays by the macho handbook of the Duterte administration. And also he plays by the very populist handbook of the Duterte administration. This person mm. is very popular, very good looking. People want to see him in, in his campaign sorties. And he dances for everyone. So No, again, celebrity. Celebrity. But he's been sitting as, uh, like, he he is currently the mayor of Manila City. Yeah. So, yeah, imagine, like, a handsome <laughs> Duterte <laughs> playing by the Duterte playbook. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it has very, you know, how Caucasian features, which many Filipinos find really attractive. And you have the sixth one. This person is not really high up in the ranks, but I, but he has been invited in many of the big uh, presidential forums, basically because of the kind of politics he brings forward. So this person um, is Cal Yodi, Yodi de Guzman. He is a labor leader. 
he comes from the socialist movement in the Philippines, has been very active in the political scene, also in demonstrations, rallies. And what he brings forward is a very anti-elite, you know, rhetoric um, and very socialist rhetoric. To, to to the table. So it's actually very refreshing and also very much a big challenge to all of the um, for, front runner candidates in the elections to be more people centered in their platform. So whether or not they need to have a platform at all is actually also a very different topic since Bobo Marcus doesn't have a platform. And he's <laughs> 60% so- up in there. Yeah, it sounds like, a, to me, like sounds like a foregone conclusion for Bombo Marcos. But at the same time, it also sounds to me like left-leaning politics isn't popular in the Philippines at the moment. Actually, um, the Philippines is a, has one of the most vibrant, most active civil society, not only in Southeast Asia, but also, but also in, in Asia. Uh, it's just that since the inequality is so, so bad, like we have a really, really huge inequality gap. Um, the elite can double down on the civil society organizations. And mm-hmm. um, they have been running the country for the longest time. So you would not, you would, you know, Kaliodi is not a, it's not an aberration really. It's just the first time that he is being invited to all of the big presidential boards because of the pushback in social media by, you know, citizens sympathetic of the socialist cause. So we have had different, candidates in the past, but they have been snubbed by the predominantly elite electoral system in the Philippines. But because, you know, we live in a world of social media where you can voice out your opinion and it's more of like an interactive um, media reporting now. The media is being pressured to also pay attention to someone like Aliodi, who, even though he has like 1% in the survey, has a very important message and has a very important challenge to all of the front running uh, presidential candidates. Mm. Since, so, uh, yeah. Ash, on, on, on that note, uh, I know that, so you mentioned six major presidential candidates that the people are taking note of, but mm-hmm. there are about, I believe, 10 total that are on the ballot. So in, in, in Leodi's case, uh, would you say that social media was instrumental in him sort of having a seat at the table in terms of when we're having the conversation about who the major, like the who's who of the presidential race are? Yes, very much. Um, at first, they were they didn't invite him at first. We have uh, GMA News, one of the major broadcasting channels in the Philippines. At first, they did not invite Alio. But there has been a lot of tweets, um, not only from the supporters of Calio, but also from the supporters of Lenny Robredo. So Lenny Robredo and Calio, they, they have the most parallel among all of the other candidates. They have the most parallel platforms. So even supporters of Lenny Robredo, who are very much active on social media because these people, many, many of the supporters also come from the middle class. They were asking and tagging at GMA News to include um Kaliodi. And you also have reporters themselves, like big reporters, going out of their way to you know give Kaliodi a platform. You have Christian Esguera from ABS CBN News. Mm-hmm. And ABS CBN News channel is a big, big platform. So he has you know dedicated one entire episode for Kaliodi. Yeah, so for, for context, so GMA and ABS-CBN, those are like the two names that you need to know in terms of the biggest broadcasters in in, in the in the Philippines. So yeah, th- that was very comprehensive. So, you know, Ash, like I mentioned, you know, uh, we do have a region-wide audience. You and I know who Bong Bong is. But for yeah. the benefit of our region-wide listeners, who the heck is Bong Bong Marcos? My and God. why does he <laughs> think he can run for president? <laughs> Where the even... Start. So first of all, I should start with the fact that I come from the same ethnic group <laughs> and the same regional group as Bongbong Marcos. We are, so we are both from the Ilocos region. And why is it very important? Because the Philippines is an archipelago. So it seems like every year it's a contest of which ethnic tribe will win these elections. Hmm. And we have only just one. We have only just have one Ilocano from the Ilocos region, winning the presidency. Um, his name is Ferdinand Marcos Sr., the father of Bongbong Marcos. He is the late dictator. He ran the country for more than 20 years. Um, he pillaged the country. He is being dubbed as one of the most corrupt politicians in the world, in the entire history of the world. 
And now you have Bongbong Marcos, his only son and his namesake. The full name of Bongbong Marcos is Ferdinand Marcos Jr. And basically, if you have a father who has been there, been the president for more than 20 years, you grew up thinking that it's your entitlement to be the next president, especially because you are the only son, you are the namesake. So for the longest time, Bongbong Marcos has been clawing his way back. Malahanyang. First, as a governor of Ilocos Region, of, of, of Ilocos Norte, second, as a senator. And then he ran for vice, vice president, thinking that it was his to grab already. But then you have Lenny Robredo, who was ranking 2% in the polls, and then from 2% to vice president. Um, yeah, so really, Bongbo Marcos, the only thing I can say about him in summary is that he has been raised. The entitlement to be the president because his father ran the country for more than 20 years, pillaged the country, um, bled the country dry, and gave Bongbong Marcos everything that he wanted. And, you know, even the presidency. And very important to mention, the wife of Ferdinand Marcos Sr., Imelda Marcos, is also among the very core people reminding Bongbong Marcos that the presidency is his. So as long as mm. Imelda Marcos is alive, all of the Marcoses, all of the family members will never stop thinking that Malacanang, the presidential palace of the Philippines, is theirs and they are just here to take it back. So Ash, my follow-up question is, how the hell is that person polling 60%? Like, was he a good governor? Oh no, he's very absent governor. He doesn't even, he doesn't even speak our language. So we have a very different language. It's very different from Tagalog. We don't he doesn't even speak the language and he he ran the province for a decade. So because, because he was never wow. there. Yeah, he was never no, there. No. And we have documents showing that he was an absentee governor. Yeah, okay. so I was about to say this is like some real Game of Thrones shit where it's like how you know how Joffrey Baratheon was basically raised to think that you know the <laughs> that uh, the kingdom of Westeros birthright. Yeah. Wait, did I no. get, get did I get my references right? But yeah. Anyway. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. <laughs> okay. Because it's Game of Thrones. So yeah. No, because I have selective amnesia because of that fucking finale, right? So it's like, okay, let's block the entire series from our minds <laughs> and move on. <laughs> Wait, but it's actually I, like I, I, I like the question of, of Andra because this is also something that boggles the mind <laughs> of not only Filipinos yes. but also people, you know, from other countries, right? Um so why the hell is Bongbong Marcos scoring sixty percent? All right, so you can you can actually see a mix of history and current events in the answer. So first of all, he would not score sixty percent if not for his running mate. Sara Duterte, the daughter of Rodrigo Duterte, who is very, very popular. Um, before the certificates of candidacy were filed, Sara Duterte is actually been, is actually has been ranking as the first choice of the Filipinos in terms of surveys for the next for the presidency. So she has been up there, number one, even you know higher up than than Bongbong Marcos but Bongbong Marcos is old like this is the last chance that he has for the presidency and they don't really have much difference with the Duterte family so they actually are made of the same cloth and this is the the last time that uh, Marcos Jr has a chance for the presidency whereas Sara Duterte is relatively young so she has like the next couple of years to prepare herself for the presidency. So she chose instead to run as a running mate of Bongbong Marcos and the popularity of Sara Duterte rubbed off <laughs> and transferred to Bongbong Marcos. So now, you know, if you look at their political rallies, it's very interesting. Um, Sara Duterte will speak first and then Bongbong Marcos, which is a, Bongbong Marcos is a very lousy speaker. Sara Duterte is a more powerful speaker. So Sara Duterte will actually pave the way for Bongbong Marcos. So she will introduce Bongbong Marcos, hype up the crowd. So when Bongbong Marcos comes in, the only thing that he has to do is to maintain the energy of the crowd. And even if the energy of the crowd dies down, the starting point is still high. So after the Bongbong Marcos speech, it will still be relatively okay with the energy. So that's one. Uh, the Duterte appeal is rubbing off of him. And also he has a lot of disinformation strategies going on. Specifically, specifically hinged on the supposed greatness of his father. 
um, if you you know if you compare the way that he branded himself in 2016 and now you can actually see now the way he is copying his father so first he now copies the speech style of bombo of of, press, of the former dictator for the democracy ah. and if you yeah and if you are you know and if you were alive then in 19 in the 1980s and it's not too long ago you know it's just you know around 40 years 40 50 years so if you were already alive then and listening to the to the voice of Ferdinand Marcos because he controlled he controlled the media right the father he controlled the media in the 1980s 1970s so if you were alive then listening to the voice you would actually identify the sameness now in their tenor i, I feel like his Bomo Marcos spent 6 years training just to sound like his father <laughs> oh uh yes so and then he always says, because his father did this and that, he will also continue this and that, while also denying all of the human rights violations of, of his father. So you have veteran um, campaign strategists now saying that for you to actually make a dent on the Bongo Marcos campaign, you have to target his father. Targeting him won't do the trick because basically it's just a copy of his father. He has no achievements. He has no educational background. He, he didn't graduate college. He didn't graduate um, in, 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 in Oxford, as he claims. He has no big projects in all of the years he's been a politician. Basically, he is nothing. He is nothing outside of politics. I've mentioned a while ago six different candidates, right? If you look at all of the candidates, they have a career outside politics. Lenny Robredo is an economist and a lawyer. Manny Pacquiao is a world-renowned boxer. Pim Laxon is a policeman. Um, Isco Moreno is an actor. Calio de Guzman is a labor leader. Bongbong Marcos is nothing. He is only the son of Ferdinand Marcos. So, wow. yes. That is so yeah. freaking yeah, amazing yeah, yeah, yeah. and fascinating. But no, like right? I, I'm, I'm imagining like, should they win? Should this ticket win it, at, at, the, at the presidential palace? Bonbon's going to go straight to the whatever your equivalent of the Oval Office is and put his <laughs> feet up on the table while <laughs> I guess Sarah Duterte does all the work. Yeah, Sarah Duterte is the foundation, basically the sixty percent. Actually, also you may find you like the listeners may find this very interesting. Even the other presidential candidates, you know, are branding themselves as a running mate or of, of, of Sara Duterte. So Isko Moreno, he is like sporting different tarpaulins with his face and Sara Duterte's face side by side as president and vice president. <laughs> because he also wants to you know, reign in the glory of Sara Duterte. But I want to point out also that not only is Bongbong Marcos the only person who he is who is nothing outside of politics among all of the front running presidential candidates. He was also the only one who grew up in a very elite family. So all of these other who all of his like opponents are from are born from working middle class families. Like he is the only one born with a with a golden spoon in his mouth. So it, this is the first time also, first among the very rare times in Philippine history where in you have predominantly people from working class families having their names up there in the presidential election. So yeah. our takeaways from this, Ash, is that Bongbong Marcos has no platform except for the fact. So his platform is basically whatever his dad did, correct? Correct. <laughs> Okay, so on that note, so um, Andra, I don't remember, but or if 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 the listeners remember, but we have written a couple of stories uh, on Coconuts Manila about Bong Bong famously dodging presidential interviews and debates as of late that have been held, you know, by by independent and major networks alike. So Ash, I wanted to ask you, what's that about? What it like? Why is he dodging these interviews, and how is this coming across to the electorate, to the people? Oh my God, this is actually a very <laughs> frustrating fact. <laughs> the fact is that his incompetence is actually the Achilles heel of his own campaign. He is the only weak link in the very formidable Bong Bong Marcos campaign. <laughs> you know, wow. I can't stress this enough. It's very frustrating. And you know what's more frustrating is the fact that it doesn't make a dent in his numbers. He doesn't attend any 
credible uh, media interviews. It doesn't want to be face to face with all of the other oppo- candidates, presidential candidates, because basically he doesn't have anything to offer. He is a lousy speaker. He stutters. Like when he doesn't know the answer, he stutters, and you have a lot of people making memes out of those stuttering moments. Um, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't even know the country. He doesn't. And you have a lot of videos showing he doesn't know the going public utility vehicle fares. He doesn't know the festivals in different parts of the, the country. He doesn't know even cities in different parts of the country. How can you not know different My where different cities in the country are, actually are when you're running for president? So he's Our- nothing. He doesn't know anything. So he doesn't attend. But he does have a lot of um, platform on social media, specifically specifically from bloggers who pose as credible people. So you know, bloggers now they can do anything they want. They can even you know act as journalists, perform a journalistic way. But in reality, they they're all they're only serving as propagandists for Bombong Marcos. Bombong Marcos attends interviews with bloggers because bloggers are not you know, pressured with the same journalistic ethos as the credible mm. media media company. So, of course, bloggers are not, you know, they are not trained. And the core of their profession does not lie in in, in accountability, in mm. evidence-based reporting, and, of course, in fact-checking. In news media, you should do that. That's basically the core of your profession. Factual right. news report with accountable with accountability and with evidence, right? So no, yeah. I, wanted, I wanted to quickly mention like Tony Gonzaga, for example, right? So so she's a mega huge celebrity in the Philippines, but she's also a vlogger on YouTube. And so, yeah, so they, they did an interview together, right? And mm-hmm. yeah, it was basically filled with softball questions. And another interesting tie is that they are actually, he was godfather to, to her at, at the wedding, right? Yeah, but it goes more than that, Sam. So actually, the, okay. the, the husband of Tony Gonzaga, Paul Soriano, is actually the nephew of Lisa Araneta, who is oh. the wife of Bongbong Marcos. My God. So the ties... This run- is really Game of Thrones shit. Seriously. I told you! I told you! This is some yeah, it's real... Family, yeah. <laughs> you know, if you want to go deeper than that, Lisa Araneta is the cousin of Mar. Araneta Rojas, who went against Rodrigo Duterte in the 2016 election, so and who has been so far seen as an opposition of the Marcoses, but they are cousins also <laughs> with yeah. they are cousins and in-laws with the with, uh, with Bongbong Marcos. Ash, what do you reckon? Yeah. So you mentioned the Araneta ties. Um, so the Aranetas are obviously one of the very top elite families in the Philippines. Mm-hmm. How do you reckon that that um Maro has is seen as an opposition figure to Duterte, but he and um he and Bongbong clearly have those ties. Um, would you do you think the opposition is genuine or are they playing to their own self interest? So uh, what do you, what what are your insights on that? Um, well, in a nutshell, the Philippines is actually now being run by elite families. And elite families, their, cir- their circle is really small. Very, very small. You have the 1% of the population and not even, the, not even the whole 1% is running for politics. You have point, you know, 0.01% of the whole population actually to preserve you know, political ties for Mary and their Mary. And not only that, Sam, you have one of the most vocal critics of the Duterte administration. Um, Antonio Carpio, who is actually the uncle of the husband of Sara Duterte Carpio. So, oh my God! <laughs> so much, so many ties to mm. to take note of. Yeah. Yes, but you know the, the only thing that you have to take note of is that this has been run for the longest time by elite families, but now you have only one among the four among the front running candidates who is from elite families. The other presidential candidates they are not from the 0.01% who have been running the Philippines for the longest time. So it's it's so frustrating that the only person who is born from elite families knows nothing. He basically knows nothing. He is nothing. He knows nothing. But he's running with 60%, the highest that you've, that, that you've seen so far in the election series, in the history of the democratic Philippines. I hope you guys yes, don't have so nuclear missiles. 
Like considering <laughs> the ineptitude of of Bumbo Marcos and if he goes onto the presidential palace. Anyway, and you were saying about the lack of, I guess, there only being one um, candidate from the elite circles. I guess, I guess that takes us nicely to the Philippine celebration of the People Power anniversary when um, mm-hmm. Filipinos fought to topple Marcos and restore Filipino de- democracy, which was, you know, like a few decades ago. Um, but in your opinion, with what's going on now, are the lessons of the People Power Revolution lost? Actually, it's uh, the lessons are actually the one of the few wells of the current situation of uh, the Philippines. So when Ferdinand Marcos Sr. was toppled down, the, there was a promise. We call it the promise of EDSA. EDSA is the huge highway in the middle of of um, Manila of Metro Manila. So this is the highway where people marched uh, um, in protest against the uh, Marcos dictatorship. So the promise of EDSA is a cleaner democracy, good governance, better social political running of the country. But basically, EDSA failed in its promise. So why did EDSA fail? So first of all, because inequality is still here. It's still very huge. Poverty still here, very huge. We are still exporting workers to other countries because they don't have enough jobs. They only have very medial, um, low-paying jobs in the Philippines. We still have corrupt politicians getting elected over and over again. Take, for example, the Marcos says, I mean, hello, they're back. They won as senators. The, I mean, Marcos, the sister of Bongbong Marcos, is actually now sitting as a senator. The son of Bongbong Marcos is now running as governor, uh, no, as congressman, the son of Aimee mean, Marcos is now sitting as governor, etc. So they're still here. Basically, EDSA failed in its promise. So because of this failure of promise, people are now disillusioned of the merits of the people power revolution. So because you, you do not see that the revolution has made changes, then you feel like it's nothing at all. And electing people actually will not get you anywhere. So whoever will get elected will never change the, the way that the country is run. And I see that sentiment not only from people outside of my family, but also within my family. Like my own parents will tell me, stop being vocal because whoever wins will not be able to help you anyway. So they won't help you. Um, Our family will not be better off just because this person will win. Because basically that has been the ongoing sentiment that nothing happened. It's basically just elite families toppling each other and we are just pawns of these elite families. So, and you see, that that sentiment has a lot of evidence on, (laughs) historical evidence in it. So, Yeah, to answer your question, actually, it's very, it's a very good question. Is the, is the, are the lessons from the EDSA lost? Actually, no. The lessons of EDSA are very strong and they are the driving force of the Bongbong Marcos campaign. Nothing has changed. Let me go. Let me get back to Malacan. <laughs> I like that cynical take, but it's accurate. No, exactly. So, yeah. So moving on from the people power. So Ash, you're you're on Twitter. We're all on social media. Uh, what's the political sentiment like online? And do you think this is an accurate reflection of how people feel about the upcoming elections? Well, first of all, my social media is now very saturated. <laughs> I have now made it, I have now made it an echo chamber, but it has it has not been like always an echo chamber. Way back in 2016, I used to do research for the elections for the national elections, and I used to transcribe um, all of the forum campaigns, etc. So I hit like on all of the pages supporting Bongbo Marcos. And now my friends who support Bongbo Marcos, their posts are now the first things that appear on my newsfeed. But ever since, I have been engaging very respectfully with them. And they have been replying in a very bad faith, in a very hostile manner with me. I started like wow. distancing myself uh, and, you know, consciously making my news feed more, you know, less <laughs> stressful for me. So yeah. I will say, for, yeah, I will say, I, I will answer your question first on what I see on my own news feed and second on what I see outside of my news feed. Um, okay. So first, it's very, it's, you have people who are strong supporters of 
Lenny Robredo, the far, the far second in the presidential election. But you also have very hostile, very aggressive supporters of Bongbong Marcos, especially because me, coming from the same region, the same ethnic group as Bongbong Marcos, I can't really distance myself from those people. Because they are my family, right. they are my neighbors, <laughs> my childhood friends. So, and they have, they, they really, it's very ironic because they are really willing to disrespect you, but also they would paint you as this person who is very politics crazed. So they used to tell me, Ash, now you have let politics consume you. But me, who, who is letting politics consume who? Because you are actually the, the you are the one. It's actually very hostile towards me. I have received very unfair hostile remarks. Like they will say I'm just angry because I don't have a, a husband. I'm single. I have, you know, very personal shit. Wow. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Those are very personal attacks. I, I don't know, Andra, exactly. is that is that a thing in Indonesia? Like, do you get personal attacks over over politics or family ties being ruined? <laughs> Or se- severed because of pol- political beliefs. Um, yeah, but it's all like religion driven. Ah, it was at least in the last election. Yeah, not so much yeah. like clans or or um, island based. True. Exactly, yeah. Island based. You know, yeah. Sorry, as you were saying. But but outside my own echo chamber, Bumbo Marcos is a very strong presence on social media. Like, the meat of this campaign is on social media because that's where a lot of this information happens. Um, especially now that it gets blurred, especially in the Philippines, what is credible and what is not credible. You have SMNI News. They have verified social media accounts, but they are being run by a Duterte and Marcos ally. You know, in the recent, because they, ho- they also hosted a presidential campaign, all the major candidates boycotted that campaign um, you have Bani Pacquiao saying, and I will not attend that forum in good, in good conscience because the owner of the, of the channel is a convicted criminal. And mm. you have Ping Lakson saying, why would I attend? I mean, Kibuloy has already professed his support for Bongbong Marcos and Taro Duterte. I mean, there's nothing there in it for me. And you also have Lenny Robredo, Isko Moreno not attending. But you have Bongbong Marcos because the whole channel is basically his ally. And he was introduced as an economist. Why? And he was introduced as a businessman. I mean, what kind of business do they have? They have been living off of, <laughs> of, of ill-gotten wealth. How do they call him an economist? He is not even a college graduate. He failed the only economic class that he attended in Oxford University. So he's now being introduced as an economist and a businessman by this verified news agency who is actually being run by a convicted criminal who is also their ally. Um, and you have... Uh, news fact, you have credible news companies being shut down, like ABS CBN. So the, the line between what's credible and what's not credible is very blurred. And Bongbong Marcos is rallying that kind of gray area to forward this campaign. So, yeah, people on social media still support him very much so now that they get their news from social media. Yikes. Um, can I take you? Outside of, well, still in the Philippines, but I want to look at this more regionally now. Um, I think we've seen a trend over the years and over the decades that, you know, a lot of Asian countries have a predilection for strongman like figures as their leader. Mm-hmm. So do you, is there any, do you have an insight as to why Filipino, Filipinos and Asians flock to so-called authoritarians? I don't know if you could call Bong Bong one. He's definitely like the beneficiary of his father. I like that question, <laughs> but also very complicated answer. So first, we have the kind of democracy, not by our own will, but also, but you know, a kind of democracy that has been forced into us by the colonial powers, whether we like it or not. So in the case of the Philippines, the American colonizers actually introduced to us the concept of democracy again at gunpoint. Um, so. After, you know, the colonial era, not only the Philippines, but also the world, you have all of these Asian leaders saying that there is a distinct Asian kind of governance that we need to float because we are very much consumed by the Western form of governance being forced into us being thrust into us by the previous colonial powers. So, you know, I can mention a lot of names that you have legal news saying the true form of Asian governance is, you know, 
more authoritative <laughs> in in, na- mm. in nature and you also have you know in Malaysia and even in Indonesia of course yeah. right so um this has been much of the the ground for you know the argument for authoritarian leaders in Asia in the 1980s 1970s and also up until now and it has not helped that social media is here where this information campaign can thrive and where authoritarian leaders really do not give a shit whether you know whether um the ethos of facts and and values and human rights are actually still being followed or upheld so yes the the, the short answer is there has always been that case that Asian values are more not just more friend not, not just friendlier but also more loving towards authoritarian figures because that's who you are Asian we follow right we have that cultural ethos that Asian people like are good at following they are good at discipline etc etc so we have always been you know uh, love in a love relationship with all of these authoritarian leaders and it does not help that social media is here giving platform for authoritarian leaders to spew this information just to forward their own cause. So it's yeah, I, I agree with you on that. Yeah, I get, I get, I get it. Like in Indonesia, for example, we had um, three decades under a uh, military general Suharto. Um, you know, he was toppled in '98 uh, by people seeking democracy, but then democracy also comes with many, many flaws and many opportunists so to speak right and uh who are no pe- the people in power and now you know you you do hear voices for of people pining for the good old days of suharto even though that was <laughs> extremely brutal if you weren't part of the elite you know mm-hmm. but a lot of a lot of people will also say that oh, Filipinos now don't care about democracy etc because they still love the territory the territory doesn't respect democracy human rights etc but if you look at the interviews and the studies done by social scientists, you will see that the elite are still very much beholden to the idea of democracy. But they will say they are just disciplining democracy. Mm. So that's very interesting, right? You, no, we are just disciplining democracy because democracy will not uh, thrive if not for discipline. So how do you discipline people? You discipline them through punishment. You have through threat and through fear. And it's easy to do that, especially if you're not at the receiving end of all of those threats and negative consequences. Because for the longest yeah, time, absolutely. the people, you know, impoverished population, um, marginalized people like indigenous groups have been the receiving end of, of all of that quote unquote uh, disciplining democracy campaign. Mm. I there, think that's a the really short of it. good. <laughs> I think. Yeah, but th- those are really interesting. You know, that's an interesting common thread that you established there, Ash. And it's a nice segue, I think, to the next question, you know, like back to the Philippines. Having said that, what leadership profile, in your opinion, does the Philippines need now? Should we, you know, elect our leader in, in the coming months? Well, first, um, the kind of leader that we should elect <laughs> Let's start with the most basic ones. Okay, let's start with the most basic ones. <laughs> so I mean, the Philippines, even the most basic ones are hard to come by. Most basic ones. First, that person has a good track record. No corruption. And also has a lot of uh, accolades already for good governance. Second, that person respects human rights. Third, that person respects due process. And the third, that person respects sector, sectoral rights, whether those are labor rights, whether those are gender rights, uh, women's rights, children's rights, etc. That person has to respect all of them. So we see that, you know, not everything is lost in Philippine democracy. You have Lenny Robredo, who has been awarded a lot of times for very transparent governance, who has proven herself that despite being um, targeted for the last, last six years, not only by the Duterte administration, but also by Bongbong Marcos, she has, deli- she has delivered um, very concrete uh, projects for, for the Filipino people. And despite being you know, short on budget because the administration did not give her enough budget, she made do with the little amount that she has and delivered a lot of uh, good for, for the Filipino people. So I think we should elect a leader like that. So of course, to lay 
my biases out of it. I am highly, highly supporting Lenny Robredo for for the presidency because for me, she doesn't check not she checks not only the basic ones but also the ideal ones, right? So ideally, we have a leader who is you know empathetic, who is always on the ground. Ideally, and in the Philippines, it's hard for a leader that kind to to make it to to the top. But here we have here we have Lenny Robredo, right? Again, she not she not only checks all of the basic things, but also even the ideal things. And sadly, she's just at far second compared to both mm. of us. But there's still hope, right? Yes, I mean we still have around 80, 70 days until <laughs> the end of the campaign period. So. Mm. We have, you know, I I, I want to say this because the supporters of Duterte and Mombo Marcos has been, have been very aggressive, hostile. So the campaign of Leonardo Brado now is says the most radical thing you can do is to love. So in Tagalog, mas radical ang magmahal. To love is the most radical thing that you can do now in this kind of, in this kind of, uh, political uh, space or atmosphere, but that doesn't work. I mean, in terms of political, com- in terms of how political campaigns are done, no, you have to attack. Um, there was this very special vice presidential debate in 2016. Bumbo, Bumbo Marcos was attending debate <laughs> at that time in 2016 um, because he, he he didn't think that he has competition because he's the most famous one. And then you have Lenny Robredo coming in at only 2%. Why would, why would I even pay attention to Lenny Robredo, a woman who, is, who only has 2% in the poll? But then during the vice presidential debates, Pinky Webb, the journalist, the host, asked the candidates, have you ever engaged in any corrupt activities? Then you have a you have a thumb, so you either you either do thumbs up or thumbs down depending on your answer. And then Robredo actually has her placard, the thumb placard, pointed towards Bongbong Marcos, right? So she pointed towards Bongbong Marcos as corrupt. So that was an attack, and it uh, it actually made a dent in the numbers of Bongbong Marcos, as shown in the data as for the twenty. 2016 elections, and it made a lot of memes. It made Lenny Robredo human to the population. It made her angry. It made her look angry, indig- indignant, um, etc. So yeah, you should. But hey, as, as you said, attack. like as you say, there are 70, 80 days left for her. So maybe she does have something up her sleeve. We never know, right? Yeah, it's I time guess. To- um, Time to yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a really, really fascin- fascinating conversation. And um, yeah, I'm afraid uh, we don't really have much time left. Um, but I do want to, I am curious though, I guess one final question for you, Ash, for me. What is happening, what is going to happen with um, Lenny Robredo's boss, current boss, Mr. Uh, Rodrigo Duterte, once he steps down? Are things looking good for him? Or, uh, he looks pretty sickly to me. He has always been that way. I mean, he has always looked old and sickly, <laughs> even even in even in twenty sixteen when he was complaining. And he always say he always says I'm an old man. So no surprise there. But I would actually correct you there, Andra, <laughs> that I don't think that 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 Rodrigo Duterte is Lenny's boss because like she has been the, the voice of the opposition for the longest oh, right, time right, right, uh, since the right. start of the campaign. But I, In terms I like of the vice question. You know? Yeah, I like the question. What happens? <laughs> What's next? What happens to Rodrigo Duterte? And you know, the answer really depends on who is going to win in the 2022 elections. Because Duterte now has an, has an ongoing investigation in the International Criminal Court for all of the human rights violations he has orchestrated in the Philippines. So, uh, depending on who wins in, in May, you know, that, in, that investigation can take a turn either for the betterment of the Filipino people or, or for the worse. So, if Lenny Robredo will win, of course, she will cooperate with the International Criminal Court. But mm. if Rumbo Marcos wins, Isco Moreno wins, and they have already signified the, their plan not to give up Duterte to the International Criminal Court, then it will look really great for the Rodrigo Duterte if Pongbo Marcos wins and Saro Duterte wins. Because let's not forget, his daughter is actually running 
as vice president and serving as the foundation of the campaign of Bongbong Marcos. So the the Marcos family will be very much beholden, indebted to the Duterte family. You know, um, mm. so they would pay the they would do they would very much pay those debts back. You know what's what's it? The Lannisters always pay their debt. <laughs> Exactly. Back to 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 the Game of Thrones. So uh, it's looking like a good future for the Draco the Third, given that Mumbo Marcos is rounding at sixty six. That's the that's the statement in a nutshell. So yeah, again, turning point. You know, we're pretty much like a real life Game of Thrones. And Andra, I'm sure you'd agree. This was a very rousing discussion about Philippine politics and you know Asian governance. So again, Ash, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing your really, really incisive insights about you know the the, the coming elections. So you know, everybody, if you enjoyed her insights, if you enjoyed Ash's insights, you can follow Ash on Twitter. At Sosholo Iha, so that's S O S Y O L O H I J A, and you can also check out her journals, advocacies, and articles at ashpresto.com. Once again, Ash, such a pleasure to have you on board. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Good fun. Okay, so after speaking extensively with Ash about Filipino politics, I can't help but see the parallels with Game of Thrones, and it just it, it can't get out of my head. It's so silly, it's so over the top, but it I can't take my eyes off of it. Like season eight exactly. included, <laughs> you know exactly, and it's like it's seven seasons of things of eventful things and it ends up in a train wreck which i hope isn't like <laughs> i hope it's not a red herring of what's to come for the hopefully philippines not. but yeah hopefully not but you know it was really really great hearing from ash on what she really had to say on the whole matter see i told you you know don't listen to my half-baked commentary <laughs> go follow her on twitter or something <laughs> yeah hopefully hopefully she won't mind coming back on like yeah, uh, sure. right before the election or just after it. Uh, and we'll see what the state of the Philippines is like by then. And on that note, um, when is the election exactly, Sam? So it happens um, in May this year. So probably like around the second week or so. So we do have like a couple of like give or take maybe like 70, 80 days before that happens. But yeah, yeah so we'll see what happens then. But for so now... So May is when the dragon's going to lose its mind and start fucking up everything, right? Exactly. Extorting people to death. Whole exactly. Whole cities. Yeah. We're doing what? what? That is we're such a, that was such a weird season. Yeah, we are. We are, we are doing season eight. <laughs> that, so we're going to see season eight in May then. But well, hopefully, hopefully not. We're, hopefully hopefully not. not. Exactly. Hopefully not. And I guess we're like, we're like in Game of Thrones' best season, you know, like, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll Daenerys... One. Hit one. <laughs> That's pretty far off. Like, yeah, but is she is she going to take over Westeros? Like, we're we're I, I guess we're we're in that moment and where we haven't f- found out that she and Jon Snow are related to each other. <laughs> uh, let's hope the Philippines rewrites uh, a better ending. Exactly, exactly, and we'll see by then. But for now, that's all the time that we have for this week. We'll see you again, same time. Same place, same podcast. Bye. No, bye. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to support Coconuts and our weird and wondrous stories, you can become a Coco Plus member at coconuts.co slash membership, make a patron payment at coconuts.co slash patron, or buy our fresh merch at the Coconut Shop at shop.coconuts.co. Advertise with our in-house agency Grow. Fast, funny, digital. Join forces with us to slay buzzwords, rise above the noise, and sow the seeds of something great. Get in touch via coconuts.co slash grow. Subscribe to the podcast and leave reviews. Tell us how you feel and what you like and don't like. We're excited to hear from you. The Coconuts Podcast delivers impactful, weird, and wondrous reporting by our journalists on the ground in eight cities. Singapore, Bangkok, Hong Kong, Manila, Jakarta, Kuala Lumpur, Yangon, and Bali. 
Listen to headline news and insightful interviews on matters large and small, designed for people located in or curious about Southeast Asia and Hong Kong. The Coconuts Podcast is a Coconuts Media production. Our hosts are Samantha Beltran and Andrew Nazri. Our executive producer is Byron Perry. Our production manager is Clarissa Cortez. And our editor is Paul Medina. Paul Medina.